So thank you very much. For those of you that don't know me, I am Scott Giambastiani. I'm one of the executive chefs here at Google and Mountain View. We have a very special guest today that I want to introduce. So thank you again for coming. I know everyone's time is precious. Uh, today I have the pleasure of introducing the editor of one of the most exhaustive Italian cookbooks, weighing in at about six plus pounds, uh, created in recent history. This volume offers something for every cook, regardless of skill, and deserves to be a fixture in every single kitchen. For the past 60 years, no kitchen in Italy has been considered complete unless it's had a copy of this Italian Bible, known as, nowadays, the Silver Spoon or El Cuchillo d'Argento. Fiden Press had published this book uh, first in 2005, and the first English language edition, uh, known as the Encyclopedia of Italian Cooking, was an immediate overnight runaway success. Later, it had been translated into eight additional languages, just to show you uh, the depth of it. A native of Italy, our guest speaker today, grew up using El Cotillo d'Argento and commissioned this book to be translated into English, so you can all benefit from it today, for the very first time. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce the editor of The Silver Spoon, Emilia Taragni. Thank you very much. Can I have the film? Can you have the film? Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you. I'm very happy to, to be here. We just have a little bit of a trailer about the book. It's a very, very short film just to have a little presentation. Well, this is just, well, this is just because uh, I don't want to just me telling you that the book is fabulous. So I'm not the only one who thinks so. Absolutely. And uh, when we published it uh, the first time in 2005, the, the press was absolutely amazing. And everyone loved it. And, uh, and there is a reason, because uh, it's, it's a really great book. So. Excellent. Can you tell us a little bit about the making of the book? Well, the book... Uh, um, we translated it from, from the Italian, but the translation was just uh, the first step before doing this book, because uh, um, the, the recipes in Italian are much, much shorter. So in Italy, I'm, I'm Italian, and in Italy we learn to cook, uh, someone says that we learn to cook before we start to talk, and uh, uh, we learn in the, in the kitchen of our family, so all the basics uh, we don't really need to read in the recipes. So the recipes in the Italian version was much shorter and a lot of things was uh, given for granted. So we practically rewritten all the recipes and they are over 2000. And also the way in which uh, uh, we display the ingredients in Italian recipes is always in order of importance of the ingredients. So usually you have the main ingredient and then the one that are less important. While in America, you always do in order of appearance. And I think that this is the main kind of cultural difference in which in Italy, we 
we don't really follow the recipes completely. We just have a look, uh, we see which is the main ingredients, and then the other, okay, you can change it. While here, you are a little bit slightly more prescriptive. And uh, so this was the main, the main job. And then, of course, we have to convert uh, all, uh, all uh, the measurements because uh, this is uh, an edition for the American market. We also have an edition for the English and Australian market. But we really wanted to have a book that is very friendly, it's very accessible, and so it was absolutely necessary to have uh, cups and spoon for the measurement. And also, um, the name, some of the products have different names in English, in uh, British English and American English. And uh, we also try to give as many, um, for example, for the fish, uh, we don't have here Mediterranean fish. So in the Italian, you have the Mediterranean fish. So we keep the, the Mediterranean fish to give the recipes as most as authentic. But then uh, we suggest that other alternatives that will give you the same results. So that was the main job. What were some of the challenges in, in putting the book together? Well, the challenging is really to have a good balance in which uh, you keep uh, the recipes authentic. Uh, and, uh, uh, but on the other hand, you make sure that everyone understand how to make it and, uh, and that everyone can do that. Sure. That's, sure. that's for, for us was the main, uh, the main, uh, the main issue. So you, you speak about authentic recipes. Whose recipes are these? Well, that's, that's, uh, that's a very interesting story of this book because uh, the book uh, started in 1950. So we are talking about many, many years ago. And there was a publisher, it was a magazine publisher, who decided that uh, he, they wanted to do a book. And it was a book that included recipes from all over the country. Uh, at that time, there was a lot of division in terms of uh, regions, but they really wanted uh, an overall view of all the great recipes that there were in Italy. And they practically sent out uh, an army of people to collect recipes from uh, small charterias, from family, from chef, from cook. From and this process uh, has, has been they are doing it, they are still doing it. So since 1950, they have this now enormous database. We are counting more than 10,000 recipes in the database. Wow. And they keep on testing, they keep on adding, they keep on deleting, <laughs> they keep on... And uh, it, it just evolved together with our contemporary way of, of eating, but keeping the tradition and the authenticity. Are there specifics you could reference on the evolution of change of the recipes, how the recipes have changed from you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago to now? Yes, they did partially. I mean, I think that Italian cuisine is probably, it didn't really change much in the last 50 years. But the, I think that all the Western cuisine went through slowly changes that, uh, for example, we now cook uh, fish and vegetable much, much less than what they did 50 years ago. And, uh, and this is a kind of slow uh, development in which we try to, to keep uh, better all uh, the property of, of food. And uh, we also try to use less fat, so and more uh, vegetable fat than, uh, than dairy fat, so more olive oil, less butter, but on the other hand, I mean, uh, if you do a tiramisu, you can't do it light. So there, is, there are some recipes that stay exactly the same. Would you say that the major difference on the updated version ver uh, on the recipes versus the past is, is more health, or are there other significant differences in the recipes? I think it's more health, uh, and also it's uh, introducing new ingredients uh, that uh, uh, Italy didn't have. Oh, OK. And also, um, opening up your mind, or the Italian's mind, towards what was around. So the, the interesting thing is that is always, there is always a development. There is nothing that is static. And I think it's, it's the beauty of it. OK. So what would you say that, um, how, is that how has the cuisine actually changed over the years? You, t you mentioned that some ingredients are now available. Uh, that, you, that didn't used to be. You mentioned, obviously, there, there's, a, there's a health concern. What are the major changes in Italian cuisine? 
Well, I, I don't. I don't think there are major changes. What, what I can see is that uh, something that uh, we always had that was uh, working with local produce uh, is something that now it's, it's all over, all over any cuisine. Everyone now is talking about it. I remember when, when I moved to, to, I live in the UK now, when I moved to London 10 years ago and everyone was talking about seasonality and local produce and. And I thought, well, that's what we do. I mean, there is no way that we eat uh, vegetables that are not in season. And I remember that there was this, the beauty of waiting for the asparagus to arrive. And there was a very, very short window. It was like four weeks in which you have the asparagus. And then there were, that's it. And I think that this is what Italian cuisine is about, is about local produce and this is also why there are such a huge variety of recipes because well first of all because it's not like as big as America but it's quite a long country so the climate is completely different from the north to the south so you have a completely different produce and because you use only what you have around you that uh, the cuisine is so different and in a way so regional I believe I read in the book that, uh, as you said, that yes, asparagus is only available when it's in peak season, but nowadays in America, obviously in Italy too, you can still find it on off seasons. Are the true Italians going to go after those products that are not in season? Why, why are they selling it if, it, if it's... Well, because of course, somebody as, 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 it. yes, somebody always somebody wants does. it. But it's, it's, just, it's just a question of culture. Of course you can find everything. Yeah. But then, if you really look at it, an asparagus that has traveled for uh, two weeks uh, and uh, has been picked when it was not at its best uh, and then uh, it's been packed and then it's, it's not the same thing. It's absolutely not the same thing. So for me, one of the most incredible things are tomatoes. I mean, in England, they are the worst tomatoes ever. They come all from Holland. They are all, uh, the, you look at them, they're pink, they have this disgusting flavor, they're nothing. So I prefer just to eat once a month, that was July, when you have it's the only month in which you have tomatoes in England, and that's it. And uh, you are just happy with it, and then you, have, uh, you do a passata, so you are fine for the entire, for the entire year. The, uh, I think the Googlers here would appreciate that because uh, uh, the cafe programs that we run here are very similar. We pride ourselves on local, sustainable. Um, we had you for lunch today at one of our cafes, and interested, uh, the Googlers I'm sure are interested, what was your impression of the Google Cafe food, the whole program? Well, I was, I was very interested uh, to see that in such a big campus, because it's an enormous campus, there is such an awareness about food and, uh, and how the, the, the restaurant is run. I mean, it's run like if it's a very small uh, uh, canteen mm -hmm. that can afford uh, to use local produce, to have fresh ingredients, to have not preserved food and, and so on. And, and for me what is important is that uh, you, don't, you, you learn to eat uh, and, this is, and you become spoiled, that I think is a great thing. Because, you are spoiled. Yeah, you are all spoiled. You don't, you don't understand what people eat. I mean, it's just disgusting. And especially in big corporations, the cantina just, they're terrible. And if you eat very well, lunch and dinner and breakfast, and then you don't want to have all the food that you, you are used to or that other people eat because, because it's such a pleasure. It's not only the fact that you have to eat and food that can be a fantastic thing and can be such a pleasure. So if, it's just, if it doesn't taste, so what's the point? So you had a good experience today? Yeah, it was great. It was we'll, really we'll, good. We're we'll walking. You can come back. Yeah, I would, I would love to. So how and why has Italian cuisine been so influential in America? Well, I think that Italian cuisine is very popular because it's healthy. It's extremely simple. It's really, most of the dishes are three, four ingredients. And it's just... Uh, you have just to put them together in the right way and to have basic ingredients. You have to have a good olive oil, you always have garlic, you have fresh vegetable, you have a very good pasta, and that's it. I mean, it's not, and then of course, meat and, and, and fish. And uh, it's the, 
the capacity of combining ingredients in a way that you announce the flavor of each of them and then putting them together, you create something that is absolutely delicious. Sounds great. So what is, what is one of your or your absolute favorite recipe in the, in the book? Well, I have, I have a few actually, um, but one that uh, very recently I keep on doing is a pesto sauce because I think it's, uh, it's a magic. You have, you have these leaves uh, that are already beautiful and that you should always have a pot of basil in, in, your, in your home. I mean, you don't really need to have a garden, just a pot is fine. And then you just take them and, uh, and don't use a blender because it will spoil it. You, the, 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 the metal with, with, um, with, the, with the delicacy of the, of the leaves will spoil it. But just with the pestle and mortar, you just break them with olive oil, garlic, parmesan, and all, it's, it's, like, it's really like a magic. All of a sudden, from these little leaves, you have this amazing sauce for, for, for the pasta. And then you cook the pasta with uh, potatoes and green beans. Uh, so the, 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 the pasta in itself started to have this very, very nice flavor from the vegetable. And then uh, you put them together and it's, uh, it's a meal. I can completely agree with when you said magical. The difference on magical between the mortar and pestle and, and, a, and a modern day blender or Cuisinart or Roboku, completely different. If you haven't tried it at home, whether it's a mayonnaise or a sauce, it's, doing by hand, it is completely different. It's a seven minutes job. <laughs> Seriously. It takes more time to minutes. clean the blender than it does to... <laughs> yes, I mean, <laughs> and it's very nice because while you are doing and then you start to add the things, you just adjust your taste uh, because it also depends how, how the basil is and then the, just when you do this moment, you have this smell coming from, from, from the mortar that is absolutely delicious. And then you can do it also a very big amount and you can even freeze it because uh, it's, uh, it will stay perfectly. And of course you're enjoying a glass of wine while you're doing this too. Yeah, well that's always. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the musts in Italian cuisine. So a, a little switch to more modern day uh, uh, America here. How would you say that modern uh, day Italian chains, restaurant chains, have either helped or hurt Italian cuisine? I won't name the names, but we know no, where they no, are. Uh, of course. I think that the problem with uh, the restaurant in America that is slightly different from in Italy. In Italy, you have the trattoria that is made. I mean, you have also high-end restaurant, but, but if you go to a trattoria, you go because uh, you, don't want, you don't want to cook at home. You, you want to take a day off. So in fact, you usually go for, for a Sunday lunch. But more or less, you eat the same thing that you eat at home. So you, you don't need anything special. While I think that uh, here, but also in, in other countries, people go to restaurants with an expectation of having something absolutely incredible, and people think that the more ingredients you put on a plate, the best. That is not always true. It can be true. So I think that there is this tendency of overdoing things in, in American restaurants, in Italian American restaurants. Mm -hmm. Uh, why, because if you keep it too simple, I was talking with, actually I was talking um, two days ago with Mario Batali, we have, we have a round table in New York about, about the silver spoon, and he was telling me that uh, his average uh, customer is really expecting to have a lot of ingredients in the, on, on, on his plate, and they say, oh, why should I pay to have a tomato with uh, pasta? And that I think it's uh, sometimes a very well done pasta with tomato can be quite uh, a treat, even in a restaurant. So, and of course, and then there are always good and bad restaurants, so that's, uh, sure. that, that, that's always a problem. So a good restaurant always do a good service, and bad restaurant always do a bad one. <laughs> yeah, it, it's definitely a challenge for restaurants. You try to keep as many people happy, yeah. but you have to be true to what your passion is, is to create, yeah. create something. And I think that it's not the culture of, of having kind of simple place mm -hmm. uh, where, where, where you pay for the food and, and you get something that you could do at home. So uh, what would you say was, is, the, is the future for Italian cuisine? Do you see any more evolution coming, newer ingredients appearing? Well, there is, uh, I think that uh, the good things about Italian cuisine is not that it's not completely prescriptive. So it's, it's more, it's more uh, for example, 
in Italy, we use the book in, in a different way. It's more inspirational than not uh, that you really follow. So you, you see a recipe in which you have two ingredients together and you understand that they really go well together, then you try something else. So you do a pasta with something and then you say, well, maybe I could do a risotto with it. So there is this capacity of always including new ingredients. So that's why I think that it's absolutely possible to do Italian cuisine even if you are not in Italy or even if you have never been to Italy. It's just, it's an attitude. It's more of an attitude than, uh, than uh, a specific way of cooking, of cooking food. So putting together ingredients in a very simple way and uh, using fresh ingredients, that, that's what it is. And I think that what is also interesting is that there is an evolution in which uh, the more you have uh, ingredients available, the more you try to, to include them. And, uh, and it will always be like this. Sure. You're holding something in your lap very dear, like, it, like it's a baby. It is. And uh, the next question is, is, is in reference to this, and I'd love if you could talk through the, the book a little bit. What are some of the most classic and tradi traditional recipes in the book, which I'm sure came from, from the original that you could speak to? Yeah, well, this is the edition 1965. Uh, this is actually my mom edition. She's promised to kill me if I don't bring it back, because she's still <laughs> using it. And um, it's, um, the recipes didn't change much. What really changed is the photography. You should have a look, because the photography is quite amusing. And uh, um, of course, there are some of the main uh, pasta dishes that will never change. I mean, you have matriciana, you have a carbonara, you have uh, all this kind of, of pasta that are set in stone, and no one will change it. And, um, and then all the, all the risottos and also all the stew and uh, the way in which in Italy you cook, uh, you cook uh, slow cook meat, uh, these are exactly the same. And what really changes the, is the presentation. You, you, you present food in a completely different way. We looked at some of the photos, they're, they're quite amusing. Yeah, they are. Um, are there any recipes in this book or even in, in, the, new, in the new published version that you won't see on a modern day uh, menu just because they're so, they're so rare? Yeah, well, there are a lot of recipes that uh, you probably won't see in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I know for sure that there are certain kind of meat that uh, uh, people are not really familiar with. Mm -hmm. So we in Italy, we, li we eat a lot of uh, uh, variety meat. Mm -hmm. So liver, tripes, uh, mm -hmm. this kind of thing. And it's perfectly fine. I mean, if people are um, not um, confident about the taste, uh, uh, there's no need uh, really to go into it. I love them. So it's interesting to read the recipes just to try to understand uh, how, how we do it and how you combine uh, this, kind, uh, this kind of ingredient. And, uh, but this was one of the questions that we had when we edited the book, uh, because we were strongly advised uh, to uh, not include the recipes that could be considered weird for certain palate, and, or even uh, like rabbit. We, do a, we, we eat a lot of we rabbit. We serve rabbit here. Yeah, yeah we do. and in England it's still not very much light. So, but we thought that uh, this, is, this is a book uh, that has been out in Italy for 60 years uh, and uh, it's not only a book in which uh, you follow the recipes, it's a kind of cultural journey in the tradition of Italian food and uh, sometimes it's also quite interesting just to read and to understand uh, how we do food. And, and if you don't like the taste, there are 2,000 two recipes. I'm sure you can find something you like. You, you've mentioned a few times just now that it's, uh, the importance of reading the recipe. And I always ask this question uh, because we have a lot of chefs, including ourselves, that are creating recipes for, for people. And I find it uh, that a lot of people don't spend enough time reading the recipe. There's an adage you can give one recipe to 10 different cooks and you're going to get 10 different results. What would be the, the advice that you would say within this, this uh, book, the new edition, to make sure that you have the success of the end product that you're looking for? What are the key, the key things to understand before actually starting to cook? 
Well, I think that uh, it's, uh, I would start from what we call the basic recipes that are the, the, the one uh, that, uh, the, the Italian dish that everyone knows and just read them to understand why they are so popular and, uh, and uh, try to perfection them so that you start really to be confident with the ingredients and then start to go a little bit more wider and uh, try to find recipes that you never heard about it but in which you think that the combination of ingredients sounds good and then start trying to invent yourself so if you can see that there is this ingredient that goes well with that one just try it out sure. and, uh, and be, be brave. Be brave. So with over 2,000 recipes, obviously the, the key takeaway from this book are the recipes, but the photos are fantastic. There's, yeah. a, there's a beautiful intro that you could talk about that has... Yeah, we can just have a little bit of... Yeah. We have some images. Yeah, we did... Uh, there is an, an introduction about the history of the book because it's quite, uh, it's quite interesting that uh, we have... This book went it's 60 years now, so he has an history. And it started, uh, when it started, was organized by region because at that time the regional uh, organization was much more strong. And then uh, it, uh, they decided it was much better to have it by course because this is uh, how Italian eat now. They, they, are, they are not only doing the recipes of their own region, but they try to mix and match. And then uh, we have a little bit an explanation about the main difference uh, in, the, in the regional uh, cuisine that is uh, mainly uh, product related. So you have a lot of uh, um, rice and meat and butter in the north. You have olive oil and, and uh, fish in, in the south. You have pasta in the, in the Naples region where, where it started the dry pasta, but now it's, uh, it's all around. So just to try to understand a little bit that there are things that are they were born locally, but now they are completely, you can find throughout the country. And also how to put together an, an Italian menu. So for example, pasta is always a first course. Uh, never, we never use it to accompany either meat or fish. And there's nothing wrong with it. It's, uh, it's, just, it's just a cultural and traditional thing. And then uh, a kind of formal uh, meal always have an appetizer, a first course that could be like a soup or a pasta or a, or a rice paste, and then either a meat or a fish or a vegetable dish, and then a dessert. So a little bit trying to explain how, how it works. And then, uh, uh, can I have uh, so we have, uh, we have the, the recipes and they are, the book is color coded by by course so for each uh, of the course uh, we have a color so you can flip through quite uh, quite easily and uh, you have a very clearly the ingredients uh, um, uh, on the on the on the right hand side and uh, uh, we have also had uh, um, preparation time and cooking time that is also very important because most of these dishes are very quick so you can really see that uh, in half an hour, you can really do an amazing meal. And, and also the cooking time is quite short. And of course, then there are recipes in which you absolutely need a long, a long, a long time. But uh, immediately, you can see what you can do. And, and then is the photography. We have done the photography all in the home kitchen. This is all real food. And the, the, the food photography can be tricky. And people use nasty things. We actually have eaten all of the 400 dishes that must, we have. Must done. have been a rough job to eat all that. <laughs> oh, it was terrible. It was terrible. <laughs> Can I have another one? Next and one. Um, yeah, these are some pasta. So sometimes we have uh, we decided to have them uh, um, photographed during preparation. Sometimes it's the final dish because I think it's also important to show how how they look. So just to communicate how you how you can prepare. Next one. Yeah, here we have My a favorite. beautiful risotto. And then we have also uh, some little drawings just to, to make it even more friendly. <laughs> Next one. This is a fantastic ribolita from, uh, from Tuscany. Next. A little bit of vegetable. For example, this is a quite interesting. This is Brussels sprout with almond. Uh, that Sometimes people think uh, that is a weird combination, but actually the, the, the Brussels sprout has this kind of nutty 
uh, flavor that combine with the almond, uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely perfect. Next. A lot of shellfish. Uh, so this just to, to, to make you understand that the book look at all the region. And uh, for example, I'm from the north, and there's practically no clearly no fish in, in, in the north. But as soon as you go to the coast, it's just uh, it's a feast. Next. Meat, of course, uh, it's very important. And you have all kind of meat. Uh, uh, that's another thing. For example, we have a lot of veal in Italy because we eat a lot of veal. That is not so common in, uh, in, in other countries. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, pork, beef, uh, uh, a lot of uh, poultry. Next. And uh, actually, a lot of game. That also is something that uh, is not, uh, it's not super common. So quail, but also pheasant and, mm -hmm. and so on. That's great. Next. And of course, Desserts, <laughs> a lot you of have dessert. To have <laughs> really, yeah. Sometimes you have twice. always <laughs> have to, yeah, you have to finish a meal with a dessert. That's Next, great. and one of the most traditional, a very nice tiramisu. So, as you can see, the photographs uh, are, are beautiful, but are also very real. So, you can make something really, really similar. So, they are not fancy, they are not uh, stratospheric. They are really, really simple and easy to make. So uh, shifting back, you mentioned uh, Mario Batali a little earlier, and uh, I wanted to ask about how Mario and uh, Lydia Bastianich, how some of these Italian sub celebrity chefs changed the perception of Italian cuisine. I think they did. They did a lot. They really did a lot because uh, um, they do the real thing. Mm -hmm. They absolutely do the real things. And uh, and uh, I remember we, we were talking. I was talking with Mario the other day, and he was telling me that. When he, when he started, the perception of Italian food was uh, spaghetti with meatball. That, by the way, doesn't exist in Italy. We, I never had spaghetti with meatball in Italy. We, we don't know what it is. It's just a completely... So, and it's fine. It's perfectly fine. If it's done in the right way, it's perfectly fine. But the perception of Italian food was very, very limited. So there were just few recipes. It was uh, spaghetti with meatball, lasagna, and pizza, and all this kind of thing. And what they did is really to open up the repertoire and to, to do things uh, that uh, you never thought that they, they, they could be Italian. And actually, at the end of the book, uh, we have also asked a chef uh, uh, in Italy, in the US, in the UK, in Australia, uh, chefs who do Italian food to give us a menu uh, with the recipes, uh, just to give an idea that uh, there is also there is home cooking as is this, it's this, uh, two thousand recipes, so enough. But also there is also gastronomy. So there are this uh, this part of the book. There are more chefy recipes, even if still Italian, and uh, it's a little bit more for people who has the desire to do something a little bit more complicated. And you will see that uh, the recipes that normally are like this in the book, then you started to, woo, <laughs> they are the full page. But it's interesting. It's interesting to see that there is also another dimension of Italian food. Interesting. Uh, in a couple of minutes, we'll open this up for questions. And, and again, when the questions start, please make sure you come up to the microphone. So we've, we've heard about the book. We've heard about your, your, your huge passion for food. Tell us a little bit about your day job at Fiden and uh, what, your, what your day consists of now. Well, actually, I, I, I'm not a, if I wasn't a food editor. Uh, my background is completely in architecture and design. So I've been, uh, I'm an art historian, and uh, I've been a curator in a design museum uh, for, for years. And then I moved to London to work for Fiden as a commissioning editor for art and architecture. And then one day, uh, I went to Milan to meet uh, an pub Italian publisher, Domus, who is a publisher of a uh, design magazine. And we were trying to, um, to do a book together. So we were, this, they have an amazing archive, so we were trying to, so we asked, uh, so we were trying to do a book with you. Have you ever done a book? And I said, oh yeah, you know, funnily enough, the only book that we ever done is The Silver Spoon. And I was with my publisher, and I said, oh, the Silver Spoon is great. It's an amazing book. I have it. It's the book that my mom has, my grandmother has. And was all, I was all excited about uh, saying something about Italian food and a great book. And my publisher, we have never done a book, a cookbook. 
my publisher said, well, we should do it. I said, no, no, we shouldn't, <laughs> because we have never done it, and we don't know how to do it. I said, oh, I'm sure you can do it. You are Italian, so you will do it. <laughs> and I was like, four years of my life. And then it was this great passion, and, uh, and I started to commission uh, cookbooks. And I still commission architecture and design, but my job is mainly to try to find interesting uh, food writer, interesting uh, recipe writer, and uh, try to bring books that are useful, books that gives you the possibility of learning about food, to eat better, and uh, to open up your repertoire in terms of recipes. And I also work with, uh, with chef, but in a slightly different way. Sure, sure. So you're obviously a natural and you've had a, a little bit of fun training going out and finding the chefs. And yes, yeah, yes, sounds great. and it's, sounds uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's just a question of passion. And, uh, and then you have to learn a lot. I mean, for me, it was, was a sort of learning curve. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, and it's interesting because for me, food is very important. It's, it's, it's incredibly important because we all eat and we always, we need to eat well for many, many reasons, not only for, for, for our health, for ourselves, but also for the environment, uh, for the farmer, for, for everyone. We really need to change our habit because otherwise it would be a disaster. When you're not traveling, how often do you get to cook at home? <coughs> Almost every night. Almost every night. I, I actually am very lucky because I can walk from my office to home and my routine is always to go to pass through either a supermarket or a market to see what is there, to decide on spot what to do, and then to go home and to cook. And it all take, and then I just spend like half an hour cooking and it's the most relaxing moment of the day. That's great. Actually, then eating is probably Then eating, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, a huge accomplishment. And if, uh, if you want to give that to me later, I'll take it with, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. We want to open it up for corporate questions. Please uh, approach the podium if you have any questions to answer. Uh, in the meantime, are there any questions you have for the Googlers or for the Google Food Program, anything out here? You only got an hour to absorb Google, and it's not enough. No, yeah, but I was, I was so impressed. I was so impressed. I just want to know if uh, being at Google, you think that your perception of food has changed? That's a good question. I don't know if, I don't know if this gentleman wants to answer it. I, I can't if he doesn't want to take it. Has your perception of food changed while being at Google? You've been here for a while. Oh, yes. Um, I think I really appreciate the flow of seasons through the food. And that's flow of something seasons. that yeah. I have an experience since I was young. Okay. That's, that's cool. Okay. Your question? Uh, so I have two questions for you. So the first one is, if you're going to go to Italy for the first time and you want to experience good food, what would be your advice? OK, my first advice would be, to go to a food market, wherever, mm -hmm. wherever you are, just go to a food market and look at the ingredients and then go to a trattoria and order the same ingredient that you have just seen in the market. Okay. And, uh, and if you go to a restaurant, try to go to a restaurant that have a very short menu. Restaurant with very big menu, we are very suspicious about them. Mm. <laughs> really very suspicious. Mm. Short menu means that they have, they buy exactly what they want and uh, what they need and it's just done very, very fresh. If you start to have like 10, 12 uh, first courses, mm, no, not sure about it. Okay, th thank you. The other question I have is this book is incredibly successful. What makes a cookbook successful? You know, how could you spot a cookbook that you think well there are there are well. different there are different reasons that makes a book successful uh, this particular book uh, is because of the recipes and is because uh, it's very comprehensive uh, and the recipes really work mm -hmm. and when we published it the first the first time uh, I really remember that uh, it went number two on Amazon all books uh, in one week wow. and that without any publicity it was just like this, because people start to, to buy, to do the recipes, and then they were just saying to friends, uh, to just, it really works. Mm -hmm. And you have everything, so you don't, especially for people who are a little bit afraid of uh, having a lot of books and having, and the other thing that I think is very good about the book is the index. Let's see, 
the book person start to talk. That's no, work. it's amazing because it's an index by ingredients up to, the recipes are indexed up to three ingredients per, per, per recipe. So you really look at what you, what you fancy it. So you want to eat carrots because, because you have just bought the beautiful carrots in the market or because you fancy carrots. And then you look at carrots, then you have all the possible recipes with carrots, from appetizer to desserts. And, and it works very well, because this is, this is how we cook. We go to the market, we go to the supermarket, we see something beautiful, we buy it, and then we cook it. I very appreciate a good index. Thank you. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, uh, my question is that I, I think it's great to hear uh, you, you speak about it, you don't really rigidly follow the recipe, you're, you're more organic and flexible with it, and I feel like that's something that I do when I cook, but I feel like it's sometimes hard for a lot of people who aren't familiar to, with the ingredients and with the cooking processes and don't have a lot of experience. What's the, what do you think is the best way to communicate or to teach somebody how to be a little bit more flexible and not have to follow each recipe step by step? And so that, you know, then you can look at five or ten. So what, my, what I do is I look at five or ten recipes based on my ingredients, and then I decide what I want to cook, and it's kind of a, it, it, I merge them all, but not everybody, I feel like not everybody's comfortable doing that. Well, I think it's, it's a learning curve. So uh, people do not feel confident to, to put ingredients together without uh, following uh, the recipes, especially, especially in terms of, of, the, of the measurement. And I think it's just a question of practice. So you, if, if you don't feel confident, it's good at the beginning to follow the recipes really, really carefully so that you start to, to be confident with your palate at the end of the day because this is what it is and you, it's, it's, it's a learning. So you have to, to learn to listen to your palate and, uh, and to understand how much salt you have to put and, but till you are not confident, I think it's a good practice to, to follow recipes and then slowly to just uh, try something different. I find if you have a glass of wine, it helps lower your stress level. <laughs> it does. I mean, if, uh, cooking should be fun, so I think that the uh, intimidation that a lot of cooks have in the beginning slowly goes away when it's, it's not necessarily wrong, it's just different. It might be bad if it's too salty or burnt, but you know, take, take your time with it, I think it's a good idea. Yeah. And I mean, also, there's the things. Don't, don't be afraid to make a mistake. Sure. Maybe don't invite people for dinner that, <laughs> <laughs> that specific night. But just, I, also, there is this idea of, uh, I, I cook a lot for myself. And I enjoyed it. So there's not, and then if someone comes for dinner, then you really, sure. You sure. really do it. But sometimes it's just trying things by yourself and for yourself, because this is also very important, cooking for yourself. Um, you, you, you talked about the regions of Italian cuisine, and, and most people just assume it's a north and southern region, but how many different regions would you say there are? Well, sometimes the food change even within regions. I mean, you have Tuscany, for example. You have completely different food from Siena to Florence. And, and again, this has to do with, uh, with, with ingredient, with tradition. Uh, with. So, I mean, in Italy we have, I think there are 22 sort of administrative uh, regions that actually are a little bit more than administrative regions. They really are different one from the other. Mm -hmm. And within the region, there are so many different, uh, uh, for example, if you look at L Lombardy, you, have, you, you go from the north in which you have mountain, really, really high mountain, and then you go in the south of Lombardy that is a complete, uh, countryside. So there are all these differences that uh, that's the reason why there is this great variety, variety of recipes. Mm -hmm. And also there is also a lot of influences. For example, all the south, as Sicily has an incredible influence uh, by the Arabs. So you have a lot of couscous, you have dried fruit uh, mixed with meat and fish. It's something that's nothing to do with the north and this clearly comes from, from the Arab culture. Would you say that, that Italy today offers uh, a more diversity of these regions? Is it easier to get uh, different, uh, different uh, regions of, of cuisine? Or do people really stick to what they grew up eating? No, that, that is why there is all this uh, 
kind of mixing. So people, I, I've lived in many different uh, uh, regions of Italy and of course uh, I was uh, taking with me my route and then trying to learn uh, new, new dishes and then mix them together. So this is something that uh, is very, very common in which uh, people travel around, move around uh, and, uh, and bring uh, with themselves their, their culture, their past, their family recipes and then they, they just learn, learn new things. For example, we, we as a family, uh, we are quite a big family, we used to travel a lot um, in summer. We, we went to many different, my, my father was very adamant to make us known the entire country. And uh, we were, and my mom is an amazing cook, and immediately after we, we, we were back home, she was able to redo all the recipes, all the food that we had uh, we have eaten, because she had this amazing palate. And actually it was interesting, because whenever she was not sure, then she was back, going back to the book, just to make sure that she had, she had the right thing. And again, it was a way of, uh, of interpreting and of then uh, uh, doing something that maybe doesn't exist, but is, uh, it's, uh, it's a mix of different uh, cultures. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to ask an internet-related one. Um, and <laughs> oh. this, is, this is a question for, for you kind of involved in the publishing industry. Yeah. Do you think, is, uh, I feel like there's a lot of food blogs, and a lot of people go to food blogs because uh, instead of cookbooks, because perhaps because they're more convenient or because you know you can search through them, do you think that the presence of food blogs and recipes on the internet and the the emergence of those websites, the very you know a lot of popular websites, do you think that helps the is like is the publishing industry concerned about that or do you or does it actually complement and help because it generates excitement for food? I think it generates excitement for for the food and I uh, I don't we don't feel really hurt by uh, having a lot of recipes on the website, on different websites, um, mainly because it's a question of trust. So the problem with having a lot of recipes everywhere is that at the end of the day you don't really know if someone tests them, if they are good, if they are real, if they are... And to be fair, still in the kitchen, I think that having a book uh, is quite uh, useful. And actually, it's, it's interesting because we spent almost more than a month uh, to try to find the right uh, size of the book uh, that uh, with such a huge amount of, uh, of pages, always open flat. So that was the main concern, so that it doesn't, it doesn't really it doesn't turn the page, so when it's open, it's open. And then the recipes never go over leaf, so you always have it on a page. And there are small things uh, that really help you and, uh, and becomes uh, very, very useful. I mean, I can see on the iPad just <laughs> good, but not really. What, what's that? What's an iPod? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> not really. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you very much. I think we have a few minutes possibly for a signing. I'm not sure, but if there's any last questions at this point, one more? Beautiful. Hi. Thank you for coming. Short. Um, I guess my question is, what are your other favorite cookbooks that are on your shelf at home? Who? Um, what are my favorite cookbooks? That's interesting, because I use mainly this. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's true, actually. Or it's reference, true. or culinary reference books? Do you use um, any of those? Well, there is, there is a, a very old uh, uh, Italian cookbook that's called Artusi that is uh, it's not for cook from because it's, uh, it's, a very, it's, a, it's a book of the 19th century. And, uh, but it's a it's quite good story. So it's very interesting uh, for... Um, for reading and for understanding the culture. But also, we have done a few other books. Uh, after this one, we thought it was interesting, this idea of national cuisine. So we thought that, I mean, this book exists in Italy. I'm sure that there are other countries in which there are similar books. So we found one in France and one in Spain that had a quite similar story. And uh, we, did, uh, we did both. We translate both, uh, both uh, in English. And, and I, do, I love Spanish food, so I use that one quite a lot. And, and also, there is, um, we have this 
uh, spin-off uh, only about tapas that uh, I thought I think is it's quite good and I, I like it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. It was great to meet you. Thank you. Love the book. <laughs>